الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر I wish to say finally, as I've said many times before, that this is not a war with Islam. It angers me, as it angers the vast majority of Muslims, to hear bin Laden and his associates described as Islamic terrorists. They are terrorists, pure and simple. Islam is a peaceful and tolerant religion, and the acts of these people are wholly contrary to the teachings of the Quran. I also want to speak tonight directly to Muslims throughout the world. We respect your faith. It's practiced freely by many millions of Americans and by millions more in countries that America counts as friends. Its teachings are good and peaceful. And those who commit evil in the name of Allah blaspheme the name of Allah. The terrorists... I want you to understand, I want the world to understand, that our actions today were not aimed against Islam. The faith of hundreds of millions of good, peace-loving people all around the world, including the United States. No religion condones the murder of innocent men, women, and children. But our actions were aimed at fanatics and killers who wrap murder in the cloak of righteousness and in so doing, profane the great religion in whose name they claim to act. My name is Ken Bailey from Liverpool and Bolton District. I'm here in Iraq, and I think this is possibly my last chance to speak to somebody who will listen from you. I need you to be compassionate, as you've always said you were, and help me. I don't want to die in حتى نراك طليقة مرتاحة وسنبقى نذبح الكفرة حتى نراك عدت إلى أمك وأبيك أو زوجك وبنيك والله أكبر والعزة لله الله أكبر The tendency of Western political leaders to deny the connection between uh, Orthodox Islamic mainstream and terrorist violence is uh, replicated in the universities and the media. Wherever you look, both in Western Europe and in North America, the members of the elite class have this tendency to proclaim Islam, some mysterious, authentic Islam, to be peaceful and to be tolerant, and those Muslims prone to violence are proclaimed to be non-representative fringe. Well, I would really appreciate if uh, people who make such claims could then explain the continuity of violence from the earliest day of Islam, from the earliest days of the Prophet and his immediate successes throughout the 13 centuries of recorded history. The real burning question in the world today is, does Islam and Islamic civilization actually sanction the violence that we're seeing being perpetrated in its name around the world? And to that we have to answer, if we're going to be honest about it, an unqualified yes. The Islamic sources, the Islamic texts, starting with the Quran, but not limited to the Quran, the Islamic texts inv including the Hadith, Islamic tradition, Islamic theology, Islamic law, 
the traditions of the interpretation of the Quran throughout history and Islamic history itself all bear witness to the fact that Islam has a developed doctrine, theology, and law that mandates violence against unbelievers. The origins are, of course, in the uh, Muslim desire to impose all over the world the only religion, the only just religion, which is Islam, and uh, the suppression of all other religions in order to uh, establish the rule of Allah over the whole uh, earth. This is a religious duty which binds the whole community and which the Muslim community is uh, obliged to, uh, to impose because they are obliged to obey the order of Allah. And this is the, the desire of Allah as expressed in the, uh, the Quranic revelation. I believe that those terrorists that want to do harm to others are applying the true Islam that was practiced by Muhammad and his followers in the early stage of Islam. In Islamic theology, the Prophet Muhammad is considered al-insan al-kamil, which is the perfect man. He is the model par excellence to be imitated. He is the person that the more a Muslim is like him, the better off he is. So the Prophet Muhammad is revered today in the Islamic world as the primary model of human behavior. Well, when Muhammad, uh, the prophet of Islam, wiped out all the Jews from Saudi Arabia, there was three tribes, Banu Nadir, Banu Quraida, Banu Qaynuqa. We were proudly studying this in school as Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, uh, ordered the beheading of the Jews of Banu Quraida and the women being taken as concubines. Uh, as soon as uh, a child had pubic hair, he was beheaded. So the, the Jewish population was either extradited or beheaded. The story of Rabbi Qanina, is a well-known documented story in Islam. Rabbi Qanina was tortured by the order of the Prophet of Islam himself. Uh, his eyes were put out. He was burned uh, in order to confess where the uh, Jewish tribes were hiding their, their goods, their gold and their silver and all those kind of things. And this is right from the Hadith. This inspired us as Palestinians, inspired us on fighting jihad against the Jews uh, in Palestine. Authoritative Islamic History The Life of Muhammad Sirat Rasulullah by Muhammad bin Ishaq Edited by Abdul Malik bin Hisham Translated by Professor Alfred Guillaume Then the Kariza tribe surrendered, and the Apostle confined them in Medina. Then the Apostle went out to the market of Medina and dug trenches in it. Then he sent for them and struck off their heads in those trenches as they were brought out to him in batches. There were six hundred or seven hundred in all, though some put the figure as high as eight hundred or nine hundred. Another example that may be even more chilling of the deleterious influence that Muhammad's example has upon the Islamic world was exemplified recently by an Egyptian leader of a radical Muslim party who wrote just recently that he couldn't believe that the beheadings in Iraq were being protested by Muslims. Weren't they aware that the Prophet Muhammad himself beheaded between 600 and 900 men personally, members of the Jewish Kariza tribe in Arabia, after he had defeated them? Didn't they realize that if the Prophet did it, then this was the proper way to behave? And so the Mujahideen in Iraq, who were beheading people, 
are simply obeying the example of the Prophet. Now we can see then that since the Prophet Muhammad himself participated in many battles and raids and did indeed perpetrate these beheadings, he ordered the assassination of several of his political opponents and he uh, behaved in general like a typical 7th century warlord. The problem is that when this is transferred to 21st century behavior, 21st century contexts of behavior, then what you get are terrorists. The Quran occupies a place that has no parallel in Western civilization. The Quran is considered by Muslims and by traditional Islamic theology to be dictated word for word by God himself, by Allah himself, through the angel Gabriel to the prophet Muhammad. As a result, every word of it is the words of God himself. Every word of the Quran, unless it is canceled by another section of the Quran itself, is valid for all time and cannot be questioned, cannot be reformed, cannot be changed within an Islamic context. This means that moderate Muslims, peaceful Muslims, if they are sincere, have to reject entirely Quranic literalism. But to do so puts them outside the sphere of anything that has been considered orthodox Islam throughout history. Because to do so is to reject the very basic premise of Islam that this is a book that is dictated by God and is a perfect copy of a perfect book, the Umm al-Kitab, the, the mother of the book that has existed forever with Allah in heaven. The Noble Quran, translated with parenthetical notes by Dr. Muhammad Taqi Uddin al-Hilali and Dr. Muhammad Musin Khan. Surah 98, verse 6. Verily, those who disbelieve in the religion of Islam, the Quran and Prophet Muhammad, from among the people of the scripture, Jews and Christians, and al-Mushrikun, other disbelievers, will abide in the fire of hell. They are the worst of creatures. So the Quran is simply a set of uh, direct commandments or else narratives, descriptions, sometimes very distorted descriptions of uh, Judaism and Christianity. Because of the normative nature of uh, th those commandments, uh, the second important body uh, for Islamic jurisprudence and for Islamic uh, uh, polity is the tradition of the Prophet, the Hadith. Now, the Hadith are absolutely necessary to make any sense of the Quran because Allah addresses Muhammad in the Quran and they talk about incidents in Muhammad's life, but they don't fill in the narrative details. So, you have to go to the Hadith, the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad, in order to understand what's being said in the Quran and why. The Hadith are many, many volumes of traditions of the Prophet. Various Muslim scholars, beginning in the 8th century, which is some considerable time after the, the life of the Prophet Muhammad, who died in 632, they started to collect these traditions and to try, through various means, to winnow out the authentic ones from the inauthentic. From an Islamic standpoint, if something that Muhammad said or did is recorded in one of those books, then it has authority second only to the Quran. And in those books, there is a great deal that illuminates what the Quran says and how it is applicable to Muslims in the present. Authoritative Traditions of the Prophet Muhammad the Hadiths of Sahih al-Bukhari, translated with parenthetical notes by Dr. Muhammad Musin Khan. Volume 4, Book 52, Hadith number 53. The Prophet said, Nobody who dies and finds good from Allah in the hereafter would wish to come back to this world even if he were given the whole world and whatever is in it.
except the martyr who on seeing the superiority of martyrdom would like to come back to the world and get killed again in allah's cause the prophet said a single endeavor of fighting in allah's cause in the afternoon or in the forenoon is better than all the world and whatever is in it since there is no sense of natural morality in islam you have to go into either the quran or the hadith to find out what is allowed and what is not allowed. And in those books we have very clear instructions from the Prophet Muhammad that it is uh, the responsibility of Muslims to meet the unbelievers on the battlefield, to invite them either to accept Islam or to accept second-class dhimmi status, dhimmi status in the Islamic State, and if they refuse both of those, then to wage war against them. Fight against those who believe not in the law, nor in the last day, nor forbid that which has been forbidden by law and his messenger. And fight against those who acknowledge not the religion of truth, Islam, among the people of the scripture, Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya, the poll tax, with willing submission, and feel themselves subdued. The Qur'an is broken down into two sections. One is called Makkiya, which means what was inspired to Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam, in Mecca. And one is called Madaniya, what was inspired to the Prophet of Islam in Medina or Yathrib. In Mecca, you find much of the peaceful verses. Muhammad used to live with the Jewish community and the Christian community in peace and harmony. So there was many verses uh, in the Qur'an that... Uh, even the Muslims used to worship in the direction of prayer towards Jerusalem. They saw many elements of a unity between the Jewish and the Christian and the Muslim faith. There are indeed some verses in the Quran that could be called peaceful and tolerant, uh, notably uh, the injunction against uh, compulsion in religion. Those verses uh, almost invariably date back to the beginnings of Muhammad's prophetic career in his native city of Mecca, where he was powerless, where he was only beginning to attract followers. Only few relatives and, and friends uh, accepted the religion at that time. And he had many foes. So the, the revelations of, of that time were very peaceful. Well, it all changes with the establishment of Muhammad's theocratic statelet in the city of Medina. He becomes a warlord, he becomes the head of a totalitarian state, he becomes very rich, very powerful, and very intolerant. And then many of these early verses, in fact, get abrogated. In Surah 2, verse 106 of the Quran, it says, or Allah says, I should say, that if we abrogate, we being Allah, abrogate a verse, then we'll give you one that's better. Whatever a verse, revelation, do we abrogate or cause to be forgotten, we bring a better one or similar to it. Know you not that Allah is able to do all things. This is the basis, the foundation, of the Quranic doctrine of Nasih, which is abrogation. And it is the idea that when there are verses that are contradictory or appear to be contradictory in the Quran, the one that is revealed later chronologically is better, as Allah has promised, and cancels the earlier one. Now the violence started. Now you had to weigh between peaceful verses and non-peaceful verses. So the edict was that these were made null and void. It is indeed a very curious concept for a non-Muslim to accept the notion that God may change his mind about a topic and may issue one injunction uh, in uh, AD 614 and then a very different one in AD 627. But this is indeed what has happened in Islam very important to understand that the Quran is not arranged chronologically, it's arranged on simply on the basis of the longest chapter to the shortest.
And so you will find in the book itself some of these more tolerant verses at a later point in the book than the very intolerant ones advocating violence and subjugation of infidels. But that doesn't mean they came into being later on. Quite the contrary. If there is ever a contradiction between two injunctions, the ones that came later on in Medina uh, are the ones that retain their validity and the early ones from Mecca have been abrogated. The peaceful verses became mensucha, means made null and void, with verses like the verses of the sword. Traditional Islamic theology has it that the ninth chapter of the Quran, Surah 9, is the last revealed in the career of the Prophet. And it is the only one that doesn't begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in the name of Allah, the compassionate, the merciful. Some have said that that's because there's no compassion or mercy in this particular chapter. And that it is the Quran's last word on jihad and in particular on how Muslims should behave toward unbelievers. In it is the celebrated verse of the sword. And what does the verse of the sword say? It's very clear. That when the forbidden months are over, Kill the people of the book wherever you find them. Lay siege for them. Lay wait for them. Lay ambush for them. Kill them wherever you find them. Uh, in fact, I converted to Christianity. Muhammad clearly stated that in the ends of days, there will be many who defect from the faith. Kill them when you see them, wherever you find them. So... This is the question that the West needs to understand. What part of kill don't they understand? Uh, you said that the president reiterated the message of tolerance and the importance that this is not a campaign against Islam or Arab nations generally. Has it been communicated to the administration from those nations from that part of the world that you've been talking to recently that is a highly critical thing for the president to do, not just once, but over and over and over again? So why? We are a country that judges people not by their religious beliefs or by their color, but by the fact that we're all Americans. So that was the first part of the message. The second part of the message is that we have a lot of friends around the world who are Muslim. We have countries that are long friends of the United States who are of the Islamic faith. And the president wanted, be, wanted to be very clear that uh, this is not a war of, quote, civilizations, that this is not a war against Islam. This is a war against people who, in many ways, pervert what Islam stands for. Islam stands for uh, peace and stands for nonviolence. And he wanted to make that very, very clear. Yeah, sure. Islam and Islamic civilization are unique in their stance toward non-believers and that Islam is the only religion in the world that has a developed doctrine, theology, and law that mandates violence against unbelievers. That there are peaceful Muslims, there are Muslims around the world who are moderate, who uh, live in harmony with their non-Muslim neighbors and have no intention of ever waging war against them in any way. But the fact is that they have a very slim justification for their own peacefulness within the Islamic sources themselves. And they are only at peace with their neighbors insofar as they are either ignorant of what Islam teaches about how Muslims should behave toward unbelievers, or they have explicitly rejected, consciously rejected those elements of Islam. There are, in short, peaceful and moderate Muslims, but no peaceful and moderate Islam. The idea that Islam is a religion of peace, however, is paradoxically enough held even by the most violent and radical of Muslims. Sayyid Qutb, the Egyptian Muslim theorist, whose writings are revered by radical Muslims today, by terrorists today, he wrote and insisted that Islam is a religion of peace. When you study his writings, it becomes clear that he meant that Islam is dedicated to establishing the hegemony of Islamic law over the world. When that hegemony is established, peace will reign in the world. 
Therefore, Islam is a religion of peace. But the problem is the peaceful Muslims don't understand the edicts that comes out of the jurisprudence of Islam. If you look at the interpretation of these verses in Al-Azhar University, in the Islamic Sharia uh, schools in, in Jerusalem and Jordan and Syria and Damascus, all throughout the Middle East, the jurisprudence of Islam clearly state emphatically that the verse of the sword made null and void all the peaceful verses. And what does the verse of the sword say? Then when the sacred months have passed, then kill the mushrikun, unbelievers, wherever you find them, and capture them and besiege them, and prepare for them each and every ambush. But if they repent and perform asalat, the Islamic prayers, and give zakat, alms, then leave their way free. Verily, Allah is off forgiving, most merciful. Kill them when you see them, whatever you find them. This is not an allegoric kill. It's a literal kill. It's the killing of Zarqawi right in front of the camera. It's the lynching that you see in Ramallah. It's the killing of over a million Sudanese in Sudan, cutting the hands and the feet from opposite sides. And here's the dilemma. The peaceful verse, even the peaceful verse that is quoted even by Bush, the verse goes as follows. Whoever kills a life without just cause or for doing mischief in the land, then as, he's, as he killed the entire earth. You'll find the same verse in the Judeo-Biblical tradition. But most Westerners never skip after that verse, which makes very clear. But as those who do mischief in the land, then cut their hands and their feet from opposite sides and crucify them, literally. And that's what you see what happened in Afghanistan. That's what you see what happened in Sudan. Amount, a huge amount of crucifixions and killings and beheadings and amputations and public assassinations. They really want to revive Islam as it used to be. This is why they call it Islamic fundamentalism. The recompense of those who wage war against Allah and his messenger and do mischief in the land is only that they shall be killed or crucified, or their hands and their feet be cut off on the opposite sides, or be exiled from the land. That is their disgrace in this world, and a great torment is theirs in the hereafter. The Prophet cut off the hands and feet of the men belonging to the tribe of Arina and did not cauterize their bleeding limbs till they died. There is no assurance of what is known in Christianity as salvation and insurance of being saved and guaranteeing going to heaven. However, there are certain things that can help. So if if a Muslim, for instance, died while he was practicing jihad, he is supposed to go to paradise. In the Islamist thinking, the assurance of your salvation is dying as a martyr. In accordance to the verse in the Quran, وَلَا تَحْسَبَنَّ الَّذِينَ قُتُلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ أَمْوَاتٌ do not think that the ones who die in the cause of Allah in jihad are dead but are living. So this assures salvation. This is the calculus behind modern suicide bombing. Many people will say, modern Muslim advocates will say that Islam forbids suicide and this is plainly dishonest because all the advocates, all the defenders of suicide bombing in the Islamic world start out by saying this is not suicide. This is, the intention of the person is not to kill himself. The intention of the person is to kill others and that is sanctioned because it is Islamic Jihad. And if in the process they are killed themselves, that's an unavoidable consequence of their actions and they will be rewarded with the reward of martyrs in paradise. Quran is quite clear about the heavenly reward for a jihadist who falls uh, fighting in the path of Allah. 
he will be granted instant access to paradise. And uh, a Muslim paradise is an extremely sensual one. It is full of huris, of black-eyed beauties that will await the martyr and uh, uh, the gratification that follows is uh, eminently unsuitable for family audience. The Quran contains no guarantee of paradise except for those who slay and are slain in the cause of Allah. Verily, Allah has purchased of the believers their lives and their properties for the price that theirs shall be the paradise. They fight in Allah's cause, so they kill others and are killed. Then rejoice in the bargain which you have concluded. That is the supreme success. In other words, the guarantee of paradise is for people who are killed while they are killing to establish the hegemony of Allah or Islamic law in the world. Jihad in Islam can be spiritual or physical. The spiritual jihad is stri striving to be a better Muslim. But also there is a physical part of jihad that you cannot take it away from Islam. Jihad in Islam means struggle. That's what the literal meaning of the word, struggle. But what the West doesn't understand is that the hadith, the compilation of the traditions of uh, the Prophet Muhammad of Islam, there's almost a, about 100 hadiths regarding jihad. And if you look at every single one of them, every single one of them has the sword, war, or a military effort. And in the end of the expedition, jihad expedition, he said, now I resort to the jihad within, the jihad that is within the self-struggle. And as a matter of fact, I had this dialogue with an Islamist one time. He says, Walid, come on, tell the West that jihad means struggle. I said, yes, it does mean self-struggle. You're right. Jihad does mean self-struggle. But so does Mein Kampf. Mein Kampf means my struggle. In the same fashion, the Islamists look at jihad. Uh, it is a very dangerous element of the Islamic teaching because uh, this instant gratification through martyrdom is an attractive concept. And by the way, uh, when a, the so-called martyr operation is carried out by Hamas, what is announced from the minarets of mosques is not the death of so-and-so uh, who carried out the attack, but the wedding of so-and-so to the Huris in other words, they immediately make the implication that uh, far from having to cry over his disappearance, over the end of his physical life, his parents should be happy and celebrate and throw a party because their son is now being not only transported into heaven, but greeted there with these voluptuous beauties. Shaheed, the word Shaheed means witness, to witness, to testify, to testify there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is his messenger. And you die as a shaheed for that cause, you're a witness, you're considered a witness, a martyr. And a martyr becomes glorified. Your family will glorify you after you die. To a Muslim fundamentalist living in the Middle East, I had to be initiated. I had to basically either kill my first Jew or destroy my first Zionist infrastructure. I had to prove beyond shadow of a doubt that I was worthy. And there are ample amount of students, teenagers, men who are willing to die as suicide martyrs, willing to put explosives the martyr application is filled. There are many applicants. There's not enough bombs to fulfill the applicants. And to get on one of those missions, indeed, you must have been chosen. You must have been really good. You must have been violent enough. You must have been uh, going out on every demonstration in the streets of Jerusalem or Bethlehem or our village. 
you must show, have shown yourself worthy of a greater operation. So when I explain what I've done and people have seen me in the community and I was worthy, uh, in, I ended up in prison, I was of course recruited. And I remember Mr. Mahmoud al-Mughrabi. He was a proud, he was proud to have planted 15 bombs and killed many Israelis. And he was being bailed out by a Jewish Israeli lawyer. He was back right in the street. So you find your bomb maker and you apply. You say, look, I want to join. I want to do my first you know, martyr operation, planning a bomb or whatever. And you need connection. So I found my connection. I rendezvoused with this guy in Jerusalem, in Shara Bab al Wad. And he built this explosive charge with a timer and a loaf of bread. And I had to smuggle it from the Temple Mount under the auspices of Al-Waqf Department. Al-Waqf Police is the Islamic police appointed by the government to watch over the holy sites. Them knowingly that I had explosive charges smuggled me so I can escape from the checkpoints. <coughs> and there, <coughs> I carried my explosive charge from Jerusalem to Bank Laumi Israel in Bethlehem. I was supposed to put the explosive charge at 6 p.m. exactly. I was supposed to have this explosive charge in my hands at 6 p.m. exactly. Five to six, I saw some Arab children running around and I didn't want to kill any Arabs. So I decided to place the explosive charge on the roof. I tossed it on the roof. At 6 p.m. it went off and there was this big explosion. I looked behind me, I see this thick black smoke coming out of the building and I started running. That's the moment I first got a glimpse of the reality of killing. I thought people have died. And I remember I didn't sleep for three days, constantly worried that I've killed somebody. Even terrorists have a reality check that you kill or you're about to die. You can sense it. This is why in Israel, the way the nature of finding out a terrorist suicide bomber is to look at their eyes. They'll have these glossy eyes, they're sweating profusely. They're not paying attention because in their mind, they're about to go. And it's, you weigh the reality of what now you're going to die. And many times I've been in this situation where I had thought that I was going to get killed, shooting back and forth as we stoned at the Israelis and they shoot back at us and things like that. I was face to face with death. When you think in your mind, you're going to die. You struggle between the requirements of your Islamic upbringing and between the reality that you value your life. And at some point, one has to outweigh the other. And for a Muslim fundamentalist, we always chose death. We always chose the suicide. My cousin died on his way to Ben Yehuda Street and he got killed. He died. I had people, relatives die and fighting the Israelis. And as I look at it now, I think, what a waste. What a waste of life. Okay, and then we say goodbye and shake hands, okay? Are you ready, John? Okay, I'm running. <clears throat> I'm running too. So, so in other words, you want to change. In other words, who gives you the right to change or top of the government in another country? It shouldn't be us that puts together the new government. It should be the people of Afghanistan, inside Afghanistan and those that have had to flee from Afghanistan. And I think that's the right way to do it. Now, can I say I've enjoyed very much doing this interview with you. And I think that whatever differences there are between us, it's important we carry on with this dialogue. Maybe one of the problems that arises out of all this is there's been insufficient dialogue between the Arab world and the West, between Islam and between people of other faiths. And I hope that we can establish a proper dialogue 
and maybe that would be some good that could emerge out of the terrible events of the 11th of September. Some personal questions, Mr. Blair, at the end. I know you have so many meetings and people are waiting outside. I've read, I think, in the Times that you read about Islam. What do you know about Islam? Well, I do not in any shape or form pretend to be an expert, mm. but I do read the What do you read? What, what, what interests you? I read the message of the Quran insofar as it can be translated, and I read about Islam. And I enjoy doing that. And I think there's, you know, I've learned things about the Quran that I never knew before. And I think a lot of Christians would be interested. That's one of the reasons I say to you, it would be good if we, out of this, we had some more dialogue and some more faith. And the reason I have to leave you now mm. is because I'm going to meet some uh, religious leaders, both Muslim and Christian and Jewish, uh, upstairs, and in order to discuss with them how we can bring the faith closer together. So, Shokram Lam Jazeera. Shukran, Mr. Blair. What did you say in Arabic? Shukran, Lal Jazeera. Shukran, Jazeera. Thank you very much. <laughs> Islam understands its earthly mission to be to extend the law of Allah over the world by force. Now this is distinct from extending the religion by force. Muslims often indignantly deny that Islam was spread by the sword, as the old expression goes, and that anybody is ever forced to convert to Islam. Now, of course, forced conversions are a constant hallmark of Islamic history, but they are technically forbidden by Islamic law. Now, the idea in Islam is that Muslims must wage war to establish the hegemony of Islamic law. Not everybody will be forced to become Muslim, but the non-Muslims will be relegated to second-class status. They will not be able to live in the society as equals to the Muslims. And it is the responsibility of Muslims around the world to fight to institute that kind of society. While we were in the mosque, the Prophet came out and said, Let us go to the Jews. We went out till we reached Bait al Madras. He said to them, If you embrace Islam, you will be safe. You should know that the earth belongs to Allah and his apostle, and I want to expel you from this land. So if anyone amongst you owns some property, he is permitted to sell it. Otherwise, you should know that the earth belongs to Allah and his apostle. The Muslims see the extent, extension of jihad as a war liberating the infidels from their infidelity and a, a, a privilege uh, for them to uh, enter in the religion of Islam and to abandon their, uh, their own belief. So jihad is seen as a favor which is given to the infidel population um, in order to change their ways and convert to the true religion, Islam. It is not for a prophet that he should have prisoners of war and free them with ransom until he had made a great slaughter among his enemies in the land. You desire the good of this world, the money of ransom for freeing the captives, but Allah desires for you the hereafter, and Allah is almighty, all-wise. In the Muslim thinking, in the Muslim Sharia, ah, the way the world is depicted is in two houses. It's called Dar al-Islam or Dar al-Harb, the house of Islam or the house of war. So the whole world is under these two houses. If you're not a Muslim, you're under the house of war. Yet in the West, the uh, apologists, the Islamic apologists would say, no, that's not accurate. It is the house of peace and the house of Islam. And in fact, that's not accurate. If you look at the Hadith and if you look at what comes from the highest jurisprudence uh, in the Middle East, that's what is being taught. No. فيها ما لا عين رأت ولا أذن سمعت ولا خطر على قلب البشر هو بيسألني يعني إذا أنا عملت عملية وفجرت نفسي هل إلي 
يعني ربنا عز وجل بيعطيني بدي اياه بيعطيني سيارات بيعطيني بارود اطخ فيها بيعطيني العاب قلت له كل ما تطلب وهل هذا حصل؟ اي شيء تطلب وهذا فعلا حصل وهل حصل بينك وبين ابنك يعني؟ هذا فعلا حصل نعرف حقيقه لو نمسك الميكروفون مع بعض ودنا نعرف ما هي الاجابه الصحيحه لهذا الطفل عندما يسال اين ابي او اين امي وقد قام كلاهما او احدهما في عمليه استشهاديه والله الاجابه باختصار لما استشهد سعيد ما حكينا ان هذا شهيد نعم ولا تحسبن الذين قتلوا في سبيل الله امواتا بل احياء عند ربهم يرزقون نعم وسكتنا الاولاد ولما اجت التلفزيون اظن ابو ظبي نعم. او غيره قلنا لهم احنا مستعدين نقدم اولادنا الاربعه نعم فطلع حاضر صغير قال وانا ليش لا؟ وانا اتمنى ان اكون شهيدا في سبيل الله وان اقتل عددا من اليهود وال والكفار الذين اشركوا بالله ورسوله واتبعوا دينا دينا غير لم يشرعه الله ولم يقو ولم يذكر في القران الكريم نعم وانا عمري وانا عمري 12 سنه ما شاء الله واحفظ القران الكريم ما شاء الله 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 يحفظك ويجعلك مجاهد ان شاء الله في سبيل الله Now the infidel population are seeing this war as a genocidal war, since as it is described in uh, the Muslim historians of jihad, as well as uh, extremely numerous um, Christian sources, this war has conducted, was conducted as um, in, in, in great ferocity um, whole cities were given up to massacres, uh, population, entire populations were um, deported in slavery or massacred. The companion of the Prophet and the second Caliph, Umar, sent the Muslims to the great countries to fight the pagans. When we reached the land of the enemy, the representative of Khosrau, Persia, came out with 40,000 warriors. And an interpreter got up, saying, Let one of you talk to me. al Mugira replied, Our prophet, the messenger of our Lord, has ordered us to fight you till you worship Allah alone, or give jizya, tribute. And our prophet has informed us that our Lord says, Whoever amongst us is killed, martyred, shall go to paradise to lead such a luxurious life as he has never seen and whoever amongst us remains alive shall become your master. There have been, in fact, uh, two big waves of uh, jihad. The Arab waves, which started in the, uh, in the 7th century, and uh, in, uh, in the course of one century only, has Islamized huge territory mainly Christian territory, from uh, uh, Portugal till Armenia. But also Islamized uh, Persia, which was not Christian, uh, mainly Zoroastrian, except for Iraq, which was mainly Christian in the north and Jewish and Christian in the south. The second wave of uh, Islamization uh, started in the 11th century with the Turkish tribes. So all these regions of Eastern Europe, um, Greece, Anatolia, which is now Turkey, but was the seat of the Christian Byzantine Empire, and um, Serbia, Bulgaria, Romania were uh, integrated into the Dar el-Islam, which is the land of Islam. So all the countries around the Mediterranean, which once have been Christian, 
became the Islamic Empire. This Turkish wave lasted from the 11th century till the 17th century, where the Turkish army were stopped at the gate of uh, Vienna in 1683. The Crusades are not understood in Muslim world today very differently to the way they are understood in uh, uh, the Western academia and in the discourse of the Western elite class. Both talk of the Crusades as an aggressive war of conquest by Christian Europe against uh, peaceful, innocent Muslims. One may ask, however, what were those Muslims doing in the Holy Land in the first place? Well, what happened is that uh, Muhammad and his successors waged a series of wars of conquest. And in one such onslaught, in the fourth decade of, of the seventh century, the Holy Land, Palestine, Israel, was conquered by Muslims. And so when uh, Seljuk Turks uh, started interfering with the ability of Christian pilgrims to go to the Holy Land, to go to Jerusalem, and uh, when their physical safety was uh, no longer guaranteed, the Western Christians acted not only as reconquerors of a land that had been once theirs, they also acted as, uh, quite rightly one might say, protectors of their holy places. Now, uh, a defensive war in the case of the Muslims is even a war of conquest because they're obligated to spread Islam. But a land which, which had once been Muslim, in particular, must be reconquered. And the jihad is the rightful name of that war of reconquest. So they could never accept uh, the, uh, the crusader states in uh, Antiochia and, and Jerusalem because they were Dar ul Harb reinstated into Dar ul Islam. And this is a contemporary aspect of the Israeli Palestinian conflict, of which many Westerners are not fully aware. Exactly the same psychology that prompted Saladin and others to fight the Crusaders is now motivating Hamas. In both cases, it is not only a matter of the nationalistic desire of Arabs to expel European or Jewish settlers, it is also the uh, Quranic obligation of all good Muslims to make sure that the land once ruled by Muslims will be reverted to their rule. From the British historian Hilaire Belloc's The Great Heresies, 1938. It has always seemed to me possible, and even probable, that there would be a resurrection of Islam, and that our sons or our grandsons would see the renewal of that tremendous struggle between the Christian culture and what has been for more than a thousand years its greatest opponent. The suggestion that Islam may re-arise sounds fantastic, but this is only because men are always powerfully affected by the immediate past. One might say that they are blinded by it. But not so very long ago, less than a hundred years before the Declaration of Independence, Vienna was almost taken and only saved by the Christian army under the command of the King of Poland, on a date that ought to be among the most famous in history. September 11th, 1683. On September 11th, 1683, the siege of Vienna was broken. That was the high point of Islamic Jihad expansion into Europe. After that, Islam went into decline, and the Islamic world was colonized and in a drastically weakened state. It seems very likely, almost certain as far as I'm concerned, that Osama bin Laden chose September 11th in 2001 to signal that the decline of the Islamic world was over, and that the jihadists were back, and were going to pick up where they left off in Vienna in 1683. If we look at uh, 
the tectonic plates between Islamic world and non-Islamic world today, we notice something very interesting, that even very diverse Muslim societies, which cannot be easily branded under one civilizational label, have something in common, and it is the tendency to be in conflict with their neighbors. If we look at the extreme southeastern outreach of Islam, we, we see East Timor, uh, where Indonesian Muslims slaughtered a third of the population of this former Portuguese colony, uh, who are, by the way, Roman Catholics. In southern Philippines, we see an extremely violent Islamic rebellion which has been simmering and uh, becoming more or less violent for years. In Indonesia itself, uh, uh, we had religious conflict in the Spice Islands, where the beleaguered Christian minority is in danger of extinction. We have very active Islamic movements, both in Thailand and in China, in Xinjiang. In the Indian subcontinent, uh, the history is tragic indeed. That's where the Holocaust, the Hindu Holocaust, took place in medieval times, a little-known episode in the history of Islam in, in the Western world, but the one that left a deep traumatic uh, mark on, on the people of the region, and where the conflict is still latently present in the province of Kashmir. In Africa, there is the constant uh, war in, in Sudan, which finally has gained some prominence in the Western decision-making circles, but which uh, has been going on for 20 years. And it's impossible to estimate the number of lives it has claimed, but it certainly goes into many hundreds of thousands. There is the constant instability in Nigeria between the resurgent uh, central and northern states which are increasingly pressurizing the government in Lagos into accepting Sharia law as the law of the land in those provinces. And of course there is Mauritania, where uh, Muslims constantly battle non-Muslim southerners. Then there is of course the Caucasus, Chechnya. And in Europe itself we have the conflict in the former Yugoslavia, between the Bosnian Muslims and Serbs and Croats, respectively, and the conflict between the Albanians and the Serbs, Albanians and Macedonians, and quite possibly before too long, Albanians and Greeks. So, if we eliminate these conflicts, if we eliminate from the equation uh, Chechnya, uh, the Balkans, uh, Sudan, the world is a pretty peaceful place. If we eliminate uh, from the terrorist equation, terrorist acts carried out by the Muslims over the past five years, we would come to realize that the war on terror is unnecessary because terror is not a very big problem. Madam President. Senator from Nevada. I've been on the floor before speaking about Islam and what a great religion it is. I've said before and I repeat that my wife's primary physicians are two members of the Islamic faith, her internist and the person that has performed surgery on her. I know them well, been in their homes, socialized with them, talked about very serious things with them. We've helped each other with family problems. I've been to the new mosque with them in Las Vegas. They're wonderful people with great families. And I've come to realize that Islam is a good religion. It's a good way of life. People have a good health code, as their religion dictates, and they have great spiritual values as their religion dictates. And it's too bad that there are some people, misdirected people around the world, trying to take away from this very fine religion. I believe that they cannot give this religion a bad name. 
I think that the power of this religion and the power of the people in this religion will overcome these evil people who are using this fine religion to do bad things to innocent people. Islam is a religion and a political system that dictates that one must uh, carry out warfare against unbelievers until they either convert or submit. And this is the uh, justification that the terrorists around the world are using for what they're doing. And that justification is uh, based on core elements of Islamic tradition. That being the case, it's uh, very difficult for moderate Muslims, peaceful Muslims, to stand up within the Islamic community and to say, this is not part of Islam. They only do so out of conscious deception, intending to mislead Westerners in, the, in accord with the Islamic doctrine of taqiyya or religious deception, or they do so on the basis of simply being unaware of what Islam actually teaches. The Prophet said, War is deceit. Lying, generally speaking, is not allowed in, in Islam. But unlike other religions, there are certain situations where a Muslim can lie and that would be acceptable, even encouraged. This concept called al taqiyya al taqiyya means uh, prevention. So a Muslim is uh, allowed to, to lie to prevent harm that may come to him or to, to Islam. When one is under pressure, one may lie in order to protect the religion. This is taught in the Quran, chapter 3, verse 28, chapter 16, verse 106. There are certain uh, provisions for lying. So a Muslim can, can lie for the cause of Islam, can lie uh, to keep peace in his family so he can lie to his wife. Uh, a Muslim can lie to his fellow Muslim to keep peace in the society. Muhammad himself order people to lie when people that he ordered to go and kill somebody they told him we cannot kill him unless we lie to that person he said okay fine lie the apostle said who will rid me of ibn al-ashraf muhammad bin maslama brother of the bani abdul ashal said i will deal with him for you o apostle of god i will kill him the Apostle said, Do so if you can. He said, O Apostle of God, we shall have to tell lies. The Apostle answered, Say what you like, for you are free in the matter. America is a land of diversity and service. I'm an African American. My forefathers overcame the trials of slavery. I am Native American. I am a journalist, wife, and mother. I'm of European heritage. One of my ancestors was a member of the Continental Congress. I'm Hispanic American. I've been a Girl Scout since I was six years old, and now I'm a troop leader. I served in our nation's armed forces, as have many of my relatives. My father served two tours of duty in Vietnam. Another fought for freedom in Gettysburg. Two of my uncles fought for our country in the Korean War. And I am an American Muslim. And I am an American Muslim. And I am an American Muslim. I am an American Muslim. Muslims are part of the fabric of this great country and are working to build a better America. The spokesmen for Islam in the Western world know how to play the game. They know how to present their cause in the way that is not only regarded as acceptable by the societal mainstream, but also reasonable and even, one might say, just. They will appeal to uh, democratic institutions 
and uh, their human rights in the full knowledge that given the power to do so, they would abolish those institutions and deny those rights to others. The Prophet said, By Allah and Allah willing, if I take an oath and later find something else that is better than that, then I do what is better and expiate my oath. When I used to be uh, working as a translator at the Loop College in Chicago, uh, the uh, fundraising for jihad movements, for the PA, the PLO at that time, uh, we would do the translation for the announcements or the uh, flyers that we hand out or we put on the walls of the, of the, of the college. And I remember uh, the Arabic would be uh, basically the facts. Uh, bring your friends. We were intending to raise funds to support our, uh, uh, our jihad brothers in Lebanon, whether they're fighting in southern Lebanon against Israel or whatever. And then comes the English part. In the English part, it'd be the standard. Uh, we will be conducting a Middle Eastern cultural party. You're welcome. We will be serving lamb and baklava. So the West doesn't understand as when we get together as a group, our conversations are different. As soon as a Westerner would come into the scene, then the whole conversation changes. It becomes palatable to a Western mind. When I used to go to work, let's say, during the Gulf War, I used to go to work at an American company. And everybody would be hovering around a TV set as soon as there's a Scud missile hitting Riyadh or something like that. And everybody will be uh, distraught, unhappy if a Scud lands in the American camp. And I will be standing there right amongst the American employees. Oh, that's too bad. You know, oh, that's too bad. I'm sorry that, you know, we had loss of life. And <clears throat> out of frustration from having to keep uh, the truth of what I really felt, I would roll down the window on the freeway going home and scream as loud as I can, Allahu Akbar, Allah is great. Allahu Akbar, because this is the chantation you do when the enemy is killed, when you win. So if it was a victorious day for the Iraqis when they land a Scud missile, it would be Allahu Akbar on the freeway. I know nobody could hear me now. And when I went to my apartment home, the rest of the apartment complex were also uh, uh, Arabs from the Middle East. We'd get together in my apartment, watch the uh, Gulf War, and uh, we'd be praising Allah every time there was some incident where Americans got killed. But it wasn't the same face that we put on when we were in an American environment. In an American environment, you played different scenario. You acted as you are on their side. So there's this whole facade that is hidden from the Muslim, from the, from the West of how Muslim fundamentalists who want to propagate jihad in America can act publicly. Is what we are witnessing today a clash of civilizations? We ask that of noted Palestinian scholar and professor of English and comparative literature at Columbia University, Dr. Edward Said. No, I, I don't think so. And I think the whole thesis is a, is, a, is a bit of a false one. Because in the first place, civilizations are not, you know, little packages that's, uh, that are kind of completely detached from each other. They're all, they're all connected in one way or another. And, you know, so-called Western civilization has many elements of Islamic and Confucian and uh, Latin American and Russian, all the things that... The basis of uh, and um, profit of this new version of Islam as a religion of peace and tolerance was Edward Said, who established in all universities and in academia this Islamic vision of peace. On this basis, the whole history of Dimitud and Jihad disappeared. Edward Said, who in his book Orientalism posited that criticism of the Islamic world on the part of Westerners was racist and imperialist. It is spread in order to make political points, to accustom Westerners to the idea that Muslims are here to stay in the United States and that they must not be questioned in terms of their loyalty to the secular framework of Western society of the United States and of Europe as well. 
that they must not be questioned in this, despite Islam's historical political character, because Islam is a religion of peace. And this fiction has become so entrenched in American public discourse as to be practically beyond question, such that anybody who does question it is immediately branded as a racist, a hate monger, a bigot. And this is a very effective tool in a country where racism is the cardinal sin above all to silence any effective debate about the continuing attachment of Muslim immigrants to Sharia law and their intentions toward the secular systems in which they now reside. Uh, is that this is not a uh, clash against Islam or Arabs. Uh, this is about freedom, not culture. Uh, it's about working with Islamic governments who want to move forward into the modern world, working with Islamic governments who see their face as the face of peace, and working against the violence and the terror uh, and the people that would seek to hold back uh, the world and would seek to disrupt uh, peace and freedom for others. And so that is what it's about for us. Um, the true faith of Islam, we believe, is a, is a religion of peace, and we intend to work with them in that regard. The true faith of Islam we believe is a, is a religion of peace. Islam has to be known as more than a religion. The idea that Islam is a spiritual religion like, uh, for instance, Christianity, is completely incorrect. It would be incorrect to describe Islam as primarily, let alone solely, a religion. Since its early beginning in Muhammad's lifetime, it has also been a geopolitical project and uh, a system of government, uh, a political ideology, if you will. Islam from its beginnings was both a religion and a system of government. For example, the Islamic calendar doesn't base year one from the time that Muhammad was born or the time that Muhammad received his first revelation from God, which I think are both what Westerners might expect, but from the time that Muhammad became the leader of an army and the head of state in Medina. This is the beginning of the Islamic calendar because in the Islamic understanding, Islam is a political and social system as well as an individual faith. In Islam, the separation between temporal, uh, uh, secular, and, and religious power is not only uh, impossible, it is heretical. Only in uh, uh, the complete blending of all aspects of human activity and all aspects of political and legal functions of the state can we have the caliphate, the properly organized state that is, that, that is pleasing to Allah. When Westerners think of religion, whether it's Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, and all the isms in the world, Westerners think that it's a personal issue. A Buddhist will go to the temple and peacefully worship whatever he does, meditates, contemplates. A Jew goes to a synagogue and does his mitzvah, his good deeds. Uh, a Muslim goes to the mosque pays uh, zakat, uh, alms, or go to the pilgrim, al-hajj in Mecca, or a Christian goes to church on Sunday, they think it's a personal issue, Reli that religion is a personal issue. So when they look at Islam, they compare Islam with the way they understand religions, and that's the first mistake. Islam is not a religion for personal use. Islam is Sharia law. Islam is a form of government to the world first, then to a personal application. It is not just how you pray or whether you pray towards Mecca. It's how you dress. You dress in Arab culture. You speak Arabic. You can't go to heaven unless you pray in Arabic. You can't read the Quran in English and expect to get good deeds to go to heaven. You read the Quran in Arabic. 
it becomes an imperialistic system that everybody now must speak Arabic, think Arabic, practice the religion in Arabic. It's a form of law, not just in how you eat, but how you get married, how you deal with your government, how you deal with your military, how you deal with the youth, how you deal with women. Uh, every aspect of your life becomes Islam. Everything is Islam. The Jews brought to the Prophet a man and a woman from amongst them who had committed adultery. The Prophet ordered both of them to be stoned to death near the place of offering the funeral prayers beside the mosque. The Prophet wrote the marriage contract with Aisha while she was six years old and consummated his marriage with her while she was nine years old and she remained with him for nine years till his death. In no way is Islamic Sharia, Islamic government, compatible with Western understandings of human rights and freedom of conscience. Traditional Islam forbids conversion from Islam, forbids anyone to leave Islam. There's no way out. And it forbids Muslims and non-Muslims to live as equals in society. It mandates the second-class status of non-Muslims, forbidding them to hold authority over Muslims, forbidding them to uh, hold certain jobs as a result. It even mandated in history that houses of worship of Jews and Christians were neither to be built or repaired, making the communities relegated to a perpetual state of decline. O you who believe, take not the Jews and the Christians as aliyah, friends, protectors, helpers. They are but aliyah to one another. And if any amongst you takes them as aliyah, then surely he is one of them. It is not possible for a non-Muslim living in a Muslim society to invoke his uh, civil rights and human rights uh, that would be independent or separate from the Sharia concept. He is expected to submit to Sharia willingly, and if he accepts his dimitude, the position of a dhimmi, uh, he will be a protected person. A protected person is uh, someone who is, in fact, a willing subordinate to the Muslim overlords. We saluted the Prophet as he stood praying, and he came out to us, and we told him that we had killed God's enemy. He spat upon our comrade's wounds, and both he and we returned to our families. Our attack upon God's enemy cast terror among the Jews, and there was no Jew in Medina who did not fear for his life. The hadith very clearly says, the hadith, which is what Muhammad said, I have been ordered to fight until Everyone says that there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. So this is how Islam spread to uh, North Africa. This is how is Islam spread all the way to Indonesia. This is how Islam spread in the Middle East. Syria was not a Muslim country. Lebanon was not Muslim. Uh, Saudi Arabia even was a mixed multitude. All throughout the Middle East, that's how Islam spread, it was by the sword. This is why you don't see any synagogues in Saudi Arabia. You don't see any churches in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Christianity uh, virtually is non-existent. Even in my village in Bethlehem, Muslims are taken over. Uh, there's only 20% left of the Christian population. In Lebanon, uh, Christian Lebanese are moving by the droves. Uh, Hezbollah there is very active. Lebanon used to be a Christian nation. Now, all of a sudden, it's being Islamized. So, Islam is moving. This is me.
messenger. Muhammad is his messenger. Deny Muslims everywhere. Deny Muslims everywhere. Deny Muslims everywhere. Muslims who come to the United States and come to Western Europe with an idea that Sharia is the law of Allah, they look upon our freedom of religion and they look upon the fact that non-Muslims are in power in the United States and in Western Europe making laws and making laws not on the basis of the law of Allah but on the basis of consensus and free elections. They look upon all that as a manifestation of jahiliya or unbelief the pre-Islamic period of ignorance as the times in any nation's history before it became Muslim is referred to. So that you have uh, Pakistan and Iran and so on, they refer to the period of their history before they became Muslim as the period of Jahiliya. They also will consider the United States and Western Europe to be in periods of Jahiliya today. And many Muslims coming into the United States and Western Europe will work to establish Islamic states here on the basis of the idea that the secular state and the state based on elections has no legitimacy. And you don't have elections about the law of Allah. You simply obey what God says. The most important thing that the West needs to know about Islam today is that it has a political character and that it is not simply a religion, but it is a religion or a belief system that mandates warfare against unbelievers for the purpose of establishing a societal model that is absolutely incompatible with Western society. Americans need to know this, Western Europeans need to know this, because Muslims are coming into Western countries while holding these beliefs and intending to act upon them. They are the motivations behind modern terrorist activity, and they are the goals of, the, of millions of Muslims in the United States and around the world. We need to know this so that we can protect ourselves. But unfortunately, because of political correctness and because of media and general government unwillingness to face the sources of Islamic terrorism, these things remain largely unknown. Islamic fundamentalism is a sleeper cell in America. A good point 
a, a good case in point is the story of Saladin. Saladin is a great hero in Islam. Saladin was the one who defeated the Crusades. There was a treaty that's supposed to be happening between the Crusades and Saladin. And the story goes as follows. The Arab mediator came to Saladin and said, the Quran says that if they concede to peace, then concede to it. Which means that if the enemy wants peace, let's have peace. Which is a verse you can find directly in the Quran. And Saladin responded with a great answer when he stated to the guy, you are an Arab and I'm a Kurd. You should know the Quran better than I. Don't forget the Quran also says, why should we concede for peace when we have the upper hand? So you find both verses in the Quran. Peace, you concede to peace when you are the weaker party. This is why you hear the term hudna. Hudna is a peace treaty, ceasefire. In Iraq, uh, Sadr asked for Hudna because he knew he can't defeat Americans. You have Hudnas all over when the uh, enemy is stronger than you are. But as soon as you gain strength, then you don't concede for peace. This is why the face of Islamic fundamentalism in the West has a facade that Islam is a peaceful religion because they are waiting to have more Islamic immigrants, they're waiting to increase in number, waiting to increase in political power, and once they do, then look out. You'll see the real face of Islamic fundamentalism here in America. ويظهر الشريط أحد الأشخاص وهو يقوم بتفخيخ حافلة صغيرة بعدد من القذائف الصاروخية قمنا بتفخيخ هذه السيارة لاعتراض رتل الأمريكي ونقسم بالله العظيم أن غايتنا هم جنود الكفر والاحتلال ولا نريد من وراء ذلك أن نؤذي مدنيا لأن دم المسلم أغلى ما يكون عندنا الله أكبر 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 It's unfortunate, but there is no negotiating with the jihadists. There is no striking a deal with them. Islamic law is very clear on that. And here, once again, is an example. We need to take Islam seriously. Islamic law does not allow for treaties. It does not allow for negotiated settlements between Muslim states and non-Muslim states. All it allows for is a temporary period of up to 10 years of hudna, or what is commonly translated as truce, to allow the Islamic forces to gather their strength. But that's not the same as peace as we know it. That's not the same as the absence of a state of war. That's only a temporary lull in a war that the jihadists consider has gone on for 14 centuries and are willing to fight for 14 more. So when you meet in fight jihad in Allah's cause, those who disbelieve smite at their necks till when you have killed and wounded many of them, then bind a bond firmly on them, take them as captives. Thus you are ordered by Allah to continue in carrying out jihad against the disbelievers till they embrace Islam, are saved from the punishment and the hellfire, or at least come under your protection. But if it had been Allah's will, he himself could certainly have punished them without you. But he lets you fight in order to test you, some with others. But those who are killed in the way of Allah, he will never let their deeds be lost. In Islamic thinking, the world is divided into the house of Islam, where Islamic polity has been established, where uh, Allah rules supreme, and uh, the house of war, which is the rest of the world. Uh, this dichotomy is uh, reminiscent of other totalitarian ideologies and most explicitly communism. 
both communism and Islam seek a, the end of history in this world. The end of history will come when either the whole of our planet becomes Dar ul Islam or else when uh, the proletarian revolution brings the avant-garde of the working class to, to power all over the world, which will be the end of state, the end of money, and the end of class oppression. In both cases, uh, it is possible to have a period of truce. It is possible to have what would be called in modern parlance peaceful coexistence. But that peaceful coexistence is a tactical ploy and not a permanent solution. Allah's apostle said, I have been ordered to fight with the people till they say, none has the right to be worshipped but Allah. If we consider that if only we changed our policies toward Israel, and if only we changed our policies toward Iraq, or changed our policies toward something else, if only we hadn't taken out the Mossadegh regime in Iran in 1953, and other things people have said to me, these ideas are ridiculous. They're based on a fundamental misunderstanding of the motives and goals of the jihadists. This is not a conflict that was created with the creation of the State of Israel, or a conflict that was created when American armies went into Iraq. The global jihad has gone on without interruption, without significant interruption, since the 7th century. And it only declined in force and activity at periods when the Islamic world was too weak to prosecute it. The question now that we have to ask ourselves is, do we want to preserve our Judeo-Christian values and our own civilization? Or do we want, do we choose to go toward a, a, a dimitude, an enlarged dimitude in Europe, which will engulf the whole of Europe, maybe not America, but America will be isolated because it will have to deal in geopolitic with the Islamized Dimi Europe. And these are problems that had, have to, uh, to be taken into consideration by European themselves in their chosen, in choosing their identity and their future freedom or dimitude, and by American also. In order to defend itself against the onslaught of global jihad, which is coming in the century ahead, I have no doubt of that, the West would need to redefine itself and to say what exactly is the geographic and cultural space to be defended and in the name of what. Defending it in the name of a tepid, lukewarm ideology of multiculturalism is impossible. Multiculturalism and postmodern liberalism are not worthy dying for. They are not something that can inspire people to do what their ancestors had done at Poitiers and uh, at the walls of Vienna in 1683. What global jihad has on its side is simple-minded commitment of millions of people to not only spread the faith, but also better themselves at the expense of the infidel, in the first instance through immigration and later on, if necessary, by other means. What the West needs to understand about Islam is that Islam has the potential of replacing the dangers that we just uh, kind of did away with, Nazism and Communism. Like Nazism and like Communism, Islamism, the end justifies the means. There is no respect for national borders. And the whole ideology is to uh, promote their way of thinking and promote their way of life throughout the entire world. That's what's being taught in the Middle East. That's what's being coming out from all the jurisprudence in Al-Azhar, in Saudi Arabia, and all throughout the Muslim world, is that Islam will conquer and will continue to conquer until it triumphs, until everybody in the world says there's no God but Allah and Muhammad is his prophet. <laughs>
ويا بريطانيا ويا انتم من قال الله في حقكم قد غضب الله عليكم اليهود يا ابناء القردة والخنازير يا من لا تكون فتنة في الارض الا وانتم عودوا ثقابها كلما اوقدوا نارا للفتنة اطفأها الله اطفأ الله نوركم واطفأ الله نيرانكم ولكننا نحن الرجال الذين انتجبنا الله وارادنا الله فجعلنا اولي الباس الشديد لقطاف رؤوسكم الاينات وظهرت وطغت وتجبرت فانا قاطفوها باذن الله The peculiarity of Islam has to be faced, and it has to be faced frankly and openly. Unlike others, and I am again saying this in, in the full knowledge that it will offend some Western ears, unlike the Hindus, unlike the, uh, the Confucians, unlike the animists of sub-Saharan Africa, the Muslims have inherent tendency to expand and to convert the rest of the world not only to their religion, but to their outlook and to their legal and moral system. They will not state this openly while they're in a minority in the countries to which they immigrate, but we have seen this time and over again throughout history. Once they reach the numbers necessary to impose their will, they will do so. <laughs> ورئيسهم والبريطانيين ومن والاهم والصهاينة ربيبة ومصنع الكيان الله أكبر لو أذن الله لنا يا أمة محمد سيقول حتى الحجر يا مسلم الله أكبر والنصر العراقيين الله أكبر والنصر لنا بإذن الله الله أكبر والنصر لنا Miracles do happen. I do not know if it is another, maybe even deadlier terrorist attack that will act as a catalyst, or whether it will be uh, a geopolitical confrontation in the Middle East itself, with Israel perhaps at, and trust, that uh, a jolt will bring back into the minds and hearts of Westerners the awareness of the need to stand up and be counted.